Hello, nephew community. My name is Sean George. I am a medical science liaison with Otsuka Pharmaceutical Development and Commercialization. I'm here with Shauna Reed, who is going to discuss vascular options for dialysis. Shauna is a board certified nurse practitioner in family practice and acute care. She has been in nephrology taking care of dialysis patients for almost seven years. Shauna, we are so happy to have you. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much, Sean, for having me. And I am so excited to talk to you about some dialysis options for our kidney care patients. Great. So Shauna, I want you to start off by reviewing the different vascular access options for a patient who is starting dialysis. Sure. So I kind of like to divide them into two areas. Um, one for in-center dialysis patients and the other for home therapies. So in-center is primarily my specialty, and so I'm the most familiar with in-center accesses. Primarily, you're going to come to in-center with a central venous catheter. That's not the ideal option, but unfortunately, that is the most common option. We then transition you to either a fistula or a graft in the dial in center dialysis setting. For home therapies, we can either place a peritoneal catheter for home peritoneal dialysis, or you can go and do home hemo with either a fistula or a graft. So give us a few differences between uh, AV grafts and AV fistulas. Sure, so AV fistulas, they tend to mature a little bit slower than the grafts at six to eight weeks. The grafts are typically ready for use in anywhere from two to four weeks, and it's gonna depend on their post-op healing. Once the swelling's gone down, any bruising, those types of things um, as to when we can cannulate them. Now, with regards to the fistulas, we need to keep in mind that only 50% of those fistulas are going to mature. As far as the grafts, the grafts, on the other hand, have some other problems. They tend to require more endovascular interventions in comparison to the fistulas in order to maintain their patency. For a graft specifically, their primary patency rate is anywhere from 40 to 50% at one year. And I've had people ask me, what does a primary patency rate mean? And that means that that access has had no intervention on it at all. So in one year, we can only estimate that 40 to 50% of grafts are going to not need any type of ad intervention. At two years, that number decreases significantly to only 25%. So three out of four grafts by two years are going to be need to be seen in an, a vascular access center and have some work done on that graft to maintain patency. So how often do patients actually have fistulas and grafts before they start dialysis? Oh, Sean, I wish I could say it was more often than it is. Um, but unfortunately, the majority of patients that are starting dialysis start with a tunneled catheter. Is that because the patient typically gets hospitalized and then they put the catheter in and then they go to the dialysis unit? Is that typically what happens with these patients? Uh Absolutely. So unfortunately, kidney disease is a silent, silent disease. And most patients don't know that they have kidney disease until they have symptoms. And unfortunately, when symptoms present themselves, usually it's a very late stage. And we've missed the boat on placing a preemptive access on these patients. So you've got the graft, you've got an AV fistula, you've got a central venous catheter or perm cath. What, what are some of the complications that could potentially arise with these various accesses? Sure. So the fistula is our preferred access. It has the lowest rate of infection, highest patency rates. It's also associated with higher patient survival. The downside of that is it does take six to eight weeks to mature. In some patients, it takes longer. But some of the issues that we can have with that are stenosis. Steel syndrome, a poor maturation rate, and those things have to be handled by an interventionalist in an access center. So what are some, uh, what are some things that they do in the access centers? What are some of the procedures? 
Sure. So typically we start off with an angiogram and diagnose what the issue is. And depending on what the issue is, they may do a balloon angioplasty. They may plan, plant a stent. Sometimes if regarding seal syndrome, we may ban something. And so we leave that um, decision making up to our interventional nephrologist. And when the patient comes back to us, I always get the operative report and identify what the issue was and what the intervention that was performed was. So as far as management goes, let's say you've got a patient who's got a perm cath infection. Mm -hmm. How do you typically manage those patients? What, what, what ends up happening? So a CVC infection can be divided into three different types of infections. So we can actually have an exit site infection where the site is just red. It may have some dry drainage around it. It may be very tender to the touch. And sometimes we can do uh, topical cream, making sure that we do very good exit site care and oral antibiotics. However, the second stage would be a tunneled infection. So that catheter is actually tunneled underneath of their skin. And at that point, if the infection migrates, you'll actually have virulent discharge and it's imperative that we remove that catheter and typically we place them on antibiotic therapy. The third type of infection is a catheter related bloodstream infection, which is very urgent. We take care of those patients in the hospital. We exchange the catheter and typically we start either vancomycin or cefzolin, which is usually unit formulary for the dialysis center. And the nurses at the dialysis center can continue the antibiotic therapy back in the patient's home unit. Now for fistulas, they can develop clots. Mm -hmm. how, are those to, how are those typically managed? So during that angiogram, typically if they identify that there's a clot, either that the patient doesn't have a thrill, doesn't have a brewery, there's no soft pulsatile um, uh, pulse when you palpate it, typically they need a thrombectomy. Um, so they will do that during the angiogram. Usually these are about 45 minute procedures, outpatient procedures um, that we do. What are some reasons those fistulas clot? Oh, that's a good question. So um, they clot because of stenosis that goes untreated. Sometimes patients are laying on their access and they occlude the access. And sometimes we're not able to specifically identify why they clotted. Um, they may have a coagulation disorder. There can be a number of variables. And sometimes we don't come up with a, a clear cut solution as to why that happened. Um, but the most important thing is that you get that clot out and salvage that access if you can. So when you see these patients on dialysis, is it very routine for you to inspect the access? What are some things you listen for or are looking for as you're rounding on these patients? Sure, so I assess accesses every time I see a patient. And typically if they have a fistula or a graft and they are cannulated already by the time I see them, I'm looking at their venous and arterial pressures. Are they within normal range? Typically, I will ask the dialysis tech who cannulated them if they've had any issues with cannulation. Are they having any bleeding post-treatment that's excessive? Um, and um, how did they, they listen to the access prior to cannulation? How did it sound? Um, if the patient has not been cannulated and they have a maturing access, I always do those things myself, but it's much more difficult when the patient's already cannulated and on treatment from for me to do that, I would risk um, an infiltration. Yeah. So who puts these accesses in? Typically the graft, and, and where do they go? Where are they located usually? So these are placed either by an interventional nephrologist, or in our case, we use a surgeon. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a vascular surgeon, and we have some very good general surgeons that help us put these in. Typically we start in the forearm, um, and we try to use the forearm first. And if they don't have good vessels, then we'll move to the upper arm. Um, and it just depends, it's patient specific. And we identify what the anatomy looks like by doing their vein mapping um, and seeing how good are their vessels? Are they straight? Are they tortuous? That we're gonna have a hard time getting a needle in? Do they have any native stenosis that's not going to make for a good access? And that determines whether or not we're going to do a fistula or a graft. 
And so, as I said before, our preferred axis is going to be the fistula, um, and our second option would then be the graft. In an ideal world, at what point do these patients should these patients have these accesses put in? Oh, that's a great question. So, an ideal world, we want you to have a fistula or a graft before you ever have to start dialysis. And in fact, all of the literature backs that up. If you start with a fistula, if you start with a graft, your survival rates are better. So that's our that's the take home message is we really have got to get these chronic kidney patients in to see a nephrologist early, um, following them, trending them out. Um, there's it's very difficult to predict when a patient is going to need dialysis, but when they need it, they usually need it very quickly. And so getting them in and established with a nephrologist is key. That's great information. Shauna, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. That was a great overview on vascular access options for dialysis. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy the discussion. We will see you next time here on NEPHEW.